Okay, everybody, I'm Angelica Ong, and I'm here to moderate our next panel. And it's about energy abundance and what nuclear can do to bring us a more prosperous future. I really love that when the previous panelist, Tia Tormanen of We Planet, said she doesn't care about energy, nuclear energy, what she cares about what nuclear energy can do for us. And this is exactly the point of my panel. I want to start by sharing a very short personal story. I was a little little kid and I, I was going to the school in Singapore at the time and we had a um, English, um, a, a British uh, geography teacher. And she told me, oh, Taiwan's a third world country. And I remember being so upset. We're not a third world country. How can you say that? But then she said back to me, well, are you a first world country? And I couldn't say anything because Taiwan wasn't there at the time. And look at Taiwan now. We're making the world's most advanced microchips, uh, the ones that are going to power our AI future. In every one of your pockets right now, if you have a phone, you have a chip made by TSMC. But back then, back in the 80s, Taiwan wasn't the Taiwan of TSMC. Taiwan was a developing country that was aspiring to industrialization. We were the Taiwan that manufactured Barbie dolls and lawn furniture for the Sears Roebuck catalog. So what supported our growth was at that time, in the uh, late 70s, in the 80s, we built six nuclear power reactors that ended up providing us with 50% of our total power use. That was the support that Taiwan got to achieve its economic miracle. And now today we have three fine panelists and we're gonna explore how can we replicate that miracle for the countries that are in Taiwan's positions right now, um, or richer or poorer, but who want to get the gift of atomic power to support their growth. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce my panelists. And we'll start here with uh, Charles Oppenheimer. You might have heard of the name. Uh, and <laughs> he's got quite a legacy to carry, but uh, he's um, doing something that is uh, in, the, in the legacy of his family, but in a different way. So Charles, why don't I let you uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Angelica. Um, yeah, um, what got me interested in nuclear energy was thinking about the legacy that, that I have, that really in the family, we always talked much more about the threat of nuclear weapons. That's what I grew up with, thinking of nuclear as something that, um, you know, primarily we need to have extended cooperation to reduce the risk. And I had kind of lumped nuclear energy into that bucket of stuff that isn't isn't as good for the world and um, not necessarily what we need. Um, but I hadn't looked into it deeply, you know, just because I'm an Oppenheimer doesn't mean I'm a nuclear engineer. And uh, I uh, had read the narrative that was portrayed in the media, the news media effectively saying this is dangerous, terrible stuff. And as we know, many people are were in that camp. And what happens if you look at it even closely at all, you see that we really need this energy source. And for me, a change of thought around abundance was a big part of it because uh, most of the environmental, I'd say leftist view was that we should reduce growth in the world, right? There's too many people, can we have less people and can we use less energy? I very much grew up in that, that feeling in the 1970s in New Mexico. I lived in a log cabin with no electricity. Uh, that was a choice um, that my parents made. It was great uh, actually running around in the woods. Um, but you can't, the whole world can't do that. You know, it's not, um, I, I feel like the environmental movement tried to go down that path. Let's use less energy. Let's not have growth, but it didn't work. Um, it, we, we need, um, it, it's not fair for the world that has not industrialized to not have access to as much energy as the Western nations have. And if you can have more energy, but it be carbon free, that's a better solution. It's more hopeful, it's more inclusive. And it's gotten me really, that, that really kicked off the seriousness that we need to address climate change combined with the idea that more could be better. More is better, I like that. <laughs> 
Okay, great. Thanks, Charles. And we're going to move on to Dr. Robert Salvaggi, who came to us all the way from Ghana. He's with the uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Energy. And uh, tell us, Robert, uh, what brings you here and what is uh, what are you doing with nuclear energy in Ghana? Thank you very much. Um, I'm with the Ministry of Energy, the Deputy Director of Power, um, in charge of nuclear and other alternative energy, and also part of the Ghana energy transition. Um, nuclear is really considered in Ghana energy transition pathway um, because uh, I'll say we have no option. We've um, uh, done all our energy analysis and we realize that um, um, if we don't go nuclear today, we'll go nuclear in the, in the, in the future to come. So uh, we're shipping our nuclear power program to make sure that we introduce nuclear safely into our energy mix. And uh, we are going according to the International Atomic Energy Milestones and um, collaborating with um, um, developed countries who are vendors of the nuclear power. And so far, so good. Um, uh, Ghana is um, hoping to be to have its first nuclear power plant by the mid 2030s uh, to make sure that um, we expand in our industrial um, growth. Mid 2020s or mid 2030s? Mid 2030s. Oh, yeah. Great. Well, that's still very ambitious. Yeah. We'll look forward to diving into that later. But uh, first of all, we have to introduce Charlene. Yeah, when, when you said mid 2020s, <laughs> next year? <laughs> <laughs> On the grid. Um, no, but uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Charlene Smith, and I'm a nuclear engineer at the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI for short. For those of you unfamiliar with EPRI, EPRI is a global leader in energy R&D and technology innovation. We collaborate with more than 400 companies in 40 different countries um, to ensure the safe, reliable, and cost-effective operation of existing um, uh, energy sources, as well as uh, help to advance um, next generation technologies. So I I'll leave it there and then kind of leave the rest for the discussion so we have maximized the time. Yeah, there's certainly a lot to talk about. And uh, actually my first question, of course, everybody can jump in, but first of all, it, it, it's for Robert because um, I realized, look, looking back a little bit, that Ghana today and Taiwan back in the 70s, it's, um, while we're focusing on different industries, we are uh, roughly at the same level of development in terms of GDP and stuff like that. Um, so when did everybody realize in Ghana that we have to go to nuclear energy and what is the support like there? And you, you even in the 2030s, that's an ambitious pathway. Why is it that Ghana needs nuclear power and how are we going to get there? Okay, so I'm going to say um, Ghana started um, its uh, energy system with clean, I mean, energy when we we had the hydros, we developed the hydros, but our next plan was to build um, um, nuclear. But as our energy consumption um, started increasing, we realized that we started doing a lot of fossil fuel. And then they come in, I mean, clean um, energy transition, and then the SDGs that we had to make sure that we provide clean energy. But when we do our resource assessments, we realize that um, we will end up building a lot of fossil fuel. And we did um, also our um, gas resource assessments and realized that by um, 2030, our gas resources will be dwindling. So now we have to depend a lot on um, LNG importation and that will affect energy security. And so we have to look for a new I mean, base load. So with Ghana, I mean, going nuclear is not an option. It's the way forward so that we'll be able to also build on the other um, renewable energy sources to be able to complement. So we started our um, nuclear roadmap and then we started moving step by step and then to make sure that uh, when our gas resources are getting out, there is a new base load where we are building enough capacity to make sure that um, we, we meet our energy demands. So um, if you look at this graph, this, the blue you see is our nuclear ambition. So we introduce nuclear slowly. And then when we have built all the infrastructure, 
then we will be able to now aggressively um, uh, build our uh, nuclear portfolio. Thereby, we all had the infrastructure, the regulation, and other technologies such as the SMRs are very much matured for it to be incorporated in industry to also support our energy demand and the industrial group. But our main target is to be a net exporter of uh, power to the West African sub-region, which is also um, having a lot of um, energy poverty um, deficiency and the cost of energy is kind of high. So when we export, I mean, it makes um, um, poverty reduction and also do have industrial growth. Can you give us an example of what this energy would mean to the development of Ghana and uh, uh, surrounding neighboring countries? I think we were talking before about the example of alum aluminum. Yes. So, um, for example, um, Ghana has about uh, 90 million tons of bauxite. And then we have an aluminum smelter, which is um, partially functioning because of the cost of electricity. So um, we need um, cheap um, power to be able to um, uh, power this uh, smelter. But our hydro dam is now supporting the grid. And if you want to get a cheap power, then you have to build coal. But this is not the way forward because the coal technology means we are um, uh, eroding our energy transition targets. So now in order to uh, close the uh, aluminum chain, you have to build refineries and they will need steam and that you will get from nuclear and you will need a cheaper source of power so that you be, will not be able to export our raw i mean uh, bauxite but we'll be able to uh, uh, reprocess it and add value to it for industrial group uh, we have um, a lot of iron ore but because of power we've not even tapped it at all because uh, we need cheap power lithium is in now but then uh, the legislation is that before you, you come into my lithium, you have to build a refinery. But you still need cheap power to do that. So all this has created um, the environment for us to access, I mean, clean energy. But this is good, uh, value addition. And that is going to, I mean, uh, improve the lives of the people. For the West African sub-region, um, we have um, a West African grid. But because of the cost of electricity, uh, people are not able to, I mean, import power from other countries. But if you, we, we, there's, uh, I would say, the opportunity to be able to capture the West African sub-region because energy poverty is there. Everybody wants power for industrialization, but they don't have the money to build fresh power plants. So if you take advantage of Ghana, which is ideal country for the first power plant to be in the sub-region, I mean, the whole West Africa is yours. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Africa is the future, right? And I, wow, that's so powerful because Africa is the future um, of our planet. And so many people there and they will be trapped in this extractive cycle of only exporting very um, low value added um, mine products or they can go up the value ladder and develop and grow just like Taiwan did, but only if we get that low carbon base load. So um, thank you so much, Robert. And on that note, I think it'll be great to move to Charlene and talk about um, where she came from and what nuclear can do for Jamaica. Um, uh, thank you, Angelica. So I'm originally from uh, St. Catherine, Jamaica, born and raised. Um, and the, the primary reason why I'm in the nuclear energy industry is to um, help to see nuclear energy realized um, in Jamaica. Um, I initially studied solar energy when I initially moved to the United States um, for, not, for obvious reasons, right? When you are exposed to sunshine for most of the year on an island, that's it just makes sense to go there. Um, and so I was studying solar research for uh, about three years in, and a part of my research was to try to detoxify the process by which solar panels are made on a very basic science uh, level. Um, but it, it, I mean, in, in, in the end, um, solar energy is, I think, is an asset for Jamaica. Jamaica is one of the countries um, in the world that has some of the best solar energy uh, resources. Um, but at the same time, there was more that I felt I needed to be done to be done with respect to um, having access to reliable um, 
um, clean um, electricity that is resilient in extreme weather events. The primary reason why I got into energy was as a result, uh, was because of my experience um, during hurricanes and tropical storms living in Jamaica. Um, why I went into solar is because I grew up in, in Jamaica. Why I went, went into nuclear is because I was um, introduced to nuclear energy um, by a um, nuclear physicist um, who happened to also be uh, from the Caribbean, he was from St. Lucia, and he introduced to me an, an, an option that really checked my boxes, primarily um, an energy source that is resilient um, in extreme um, weather events. It can provide reliable power, it's low emissions, check, check, check. That's where I, I wanted to go, and that's ultimately what brought me into uh, the nuclear energy industry. Well, that, that's really beautiful. And I think it, it speaks to also why I became a, so into nuclear energy. I used to report on offshore wind. Um, I'm still considered Taiwan's top offshore wind influencer by some. But <laughs> I, so I moved to nuclear. Um, in, in the process, many of my offshore wind friends said, Angelica, have you abandoned us? Why have you abandoned us? And, and I said, no, I haven't abandoned you. But Taiwan cannot decarbonize on an intermittent source alone. So nuclear, just like um, just like solar in Jamaica, wind in Taiwan, it can be a component, but we still need that uh, stable base load. Uh, by the way, uh, Charlene, because you're a nuclear engineer, I wanna ask you this question, which is when Taiwan decarbonized, well, not decarbonized, at that time it, was, it wasn't really a issue, when Taiwan got its stable base load through nuclear, Light water reactors were the only item on the menu. And now we have all these different countries that are seeking nuclear reactors, um, these, these uh, hopeful countries. Uh, what do you think is on the menu for them? Do you still think that it's best to go step by step through the light water reactor phase? Or is there an opportunity to leapfrog with the advanced technologies that are around the corner? That's a really good question, Angelica. Uh, I, I, I don't think the answer is the same across the board for many different countries. I think um, in terms of emerging countries um, who don't um, currently utilize nuclear power, maybe we have a research reactor that's been operating since the 1980s. Um, operation of a research reactor is, 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 is very different from operating a nuclear power plant. And I think um, we, emerging countries like Jamaica, Jamaica has shown interest in, 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 in nuclear. So countries that have show, are, that are showing interest in nuclear power and emerging countries that are looking to deploy nuclear energy should really start with the technology that has the most operational experience, and that is uh, light water reactors. And if not the conventional light water reactors, the small modular reactor uh, reactors that um, use light water um, to cool the reactor. And I think starting there from, from those countries that are trying to enter the space, um, is the most strategic way um, uh, to go. But of course, for the nuclear mature countries that have had light water reactors operating for decades, um, they may, it may be uh, more um, impactful to take the next step uh, by looking at the Gen 4 reactors that, are, that can be cool, that can have different coolants. Well, uh, let's zone in a little bit on Jamaica. You talk about uh, maybe research reactor. Is that where uh, Jamaica is at? Can you give us a little bit about the history there? And maybe what could be the next step and the current um, environment politically or economically when it comes to um, suitability for the next step? Yeah, of course. So Jamaica operates um, the Caribbean's only nuclear reactor. Um, it's a research reactor called Slowpoke. Um, the reactor is primarily... <laughs> Yeah, a very interesting, very, very fitting name. Um, the reactor is primarily used um, for neutron activation analysis. And ultimately what that means is that they use the reactor to determine if there are harmful toxins, uh, toxins in, in, in food. So for example, yam, rice, banana, anything like that. Um, if you are a person, for example, that has a farm and you are trying to grow some crops on the farm, um, but you, you really wanna assess what the soil, what's in the soil to make sure that it, it is appropriate or suitable for, for plant growth. You can send that soil sample to the reactor. The reactor will tell you if there's arsenic in it, what level, et cetera. And so that's primarily what um, they do with the reactor. Um, in terms of what's next, I'm really interested uh, in hearing more from Robert because um, 
the pathway to nuclear um, as a country that's interesting, interested in nuclear is it's, it's something that is not clearly defined. Right. Um, I think it's easier for uh, most of the countries in the West to ultimately, you know, go about identifying a technology and, and pursuing that because of the infrastructure that's already there. Um, but looking at, at, at Ghana's story um, and how they're trying to uh, develop their uh, nuclear energy infrastructure is very interesting um, to Jamaica. I think there are a lot of issues to address on the table. Um, and, I, and I go to different conferences and meetings and I hear people talk about, oh, it's a chicken and egg problem. You need to so solve the fuel supply issue problem before you even start to think about licensing these, these reactors or you need to figure out where you're gonna get the money from before you even, and it, these are all concurrent issues that need to be solved in tandem. And I think that uh, from, a, from the perspective of Jamaica and where Jamaica is right now, I think, Foremost, we need to be trying to um, educate the public, educate um, the leaders, um, and trying to ultimately, you know, build expertise in a way that can flush uh, flush through the rest of those challenges that are that are up the hill that we need to get to. Great, Charlene. And on a personal note, I'd just like to ask: Do you think that you will go back to Jamaica one day and work on nuclear? That's the idea, I hope. <laughs> um, uh, it seems that um, that may come later, much, much later um, uh, in the future, but, but that's essentially the hope. And I'm doing everything I can in, the, in, in, in my capacity to try to help to push um, that forward. And, and I do that by developing nuclear engineering programs for secondary students in Jamaica to introduce uh, fields of study, in this case, nuclear engineering, um, that's not offered anywhere for study in the Caribbean. And so starting there, going back to my alma mater and, get, and, and, and garnering interest in that area, I'm also, I also host nuclear engineering, uh, nuclear energy symposiums that is more open to secondary students, university students, faculty, so that we can have an open dialogue, open and informed dialogue about um, nuclear energy and, and what it could do for the country. And so in the capacity that I am now, I'm incrementally trying to contribute. Um, but if we can get there in terms of um, establishing a Jamaica adjacent Department of Energy for nuclear energy or, um, you know, having a small modular reactor plant on the island, um, that, that's ultimately what would really drive um, me back to the country. Well, we believe in her, don't we, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> And uh, now we talking about uh, all the obstacles to all this abundance that seems so technically possible, um, but there's still so many problems in the way. And one of the big ones is financial. Um, whether it's in Ghana or in the United States, it takes a lot of money to build a nuclear power plant, but we know it can be done. And uh, we'll hear from Charles now because he's working on this exact same problem. And I have to say, there's been a lot of energy on this very topic Pun right intended. here. <laughs> a lot of energy. Pun absolutely I use it all intended. The time. It's a great uh, right here in New York City. So, Charles, tell us about what you've been up to. Yeah, um, I think recognizing the difficulty in getting to the energy abundance that we know nuclear could bring um, uh, is important, especially, you know, in the developing countries, but even not in a developing country in United States and uh, first world countries. Um, uh, the, the primary problem stopping nuclear expansion in general has been financial. Ultimately, it comes down to a corporation or even a country deciding, do we have the resources to put into this entity? That's been for a long, long time in the United States where a lot of projects were canceled. It wasn't just because of protesters and backlash. It was really looking at the money they were gonna put in and what they expected on the outcome and they, uh, the corporations, utilities couldn't justify it, started slowing things down. and effectively the world is mostly still in that state even with the public perception changed a lot of excitement a lot of technical development most of the time um the question comes down to do we have the resources to put into this um recently i was in belgium or uh kind of brussels um kind of recently in march and that was the follow-up to cop and it was the um 
uh, heads of state were coming to say, we support nuclear energy. And almost every single head of state got up on stage and said, we support it. We've changed our plans and we need to figure out how to finance it. And um, that's a little daunting. You know, these are the governments themselves of the developed world saying that they can't um, pay for it. And so what is the path forward? Um, I had some hopes coming out of COP that, okay, we've had 25 countries saying that they're going to triple um, nuclear. So I was going to go around to the heads of state and say, how much can I put you down for? I'd like a little fun. We'll each contribute. Then we'll go pick out the best place in the world to develop nuclear energy, which in my opinion, morally and in almost every other way, economically, it should be the energy poor places in the world, right? That's a triple benefit. You need more economic uh, resources that you talked about. You need more energy and it prevents the expansion of the fossil fuels that we know could happen. It's, it's the right thing to do for the world. But um, I was soon dissuaded from that when I realized, you know, um, some of the blockers to a financial strategy of investing in it is there's really not a lot of projects. So if you look at a nuclear energy project from a financial lens, you need a site, you need usually a approved design. It can't be theoretical. It can't just be a science project. You have to say, I'm going to put my money in this and I'm going to get it out. Um, so all that is to say that I, I think it would be great if we had the kind of global cooperation we need to solve that problem. I think that there's hope for that, but the financial blockers that are stopping us in the U.S., I've ended up uh, concentrating on. Um, for example, if we can't afford, uh, according to our financial models, to develop nuclear energy in the U.S., uh, how can, uh, you know, what is the realistic option for going to other places in the world? Well, well, Charles, I'll just uh, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding that is that you're not just advocating for this. You are creating a venture for this. Right. And you are actually trying to put a framework, put a structure so that there can be investment in 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 this prompt thing that everybody wants and says is good, but um, it seems also to be very risky. I was there um, on Monday at the Nezio nuclear event um, at 30 Rock, and we saw a lot of head of state, a lot of um, money, um, leaders in finance coming together and talking about nuclear, and they're excited, but how do we get from here to there? And what does your venture specifically want to offer? Yeah. Um, so yeah, great question. You get the bankers to show up um, to an event like that. And we actually had a private round table yesterday with a lot of bankers at the table saying they want to invest, but um, what you really need or what I've gone through a little development, um, uh, a process of trying to understand this is it's not okay. It's not enough to say that in the abstract, you need an actual project. And I've found the need like in the U S to try to help start a project. So you have the customers, for example, utilities who do not want to buy a product that could bankrupt them um, and get them fired and make their stock go down. Reasonable, right? They don't want to do that. Um, so you, you by uh, then you have a lot of capital in the world that says we would like to invest in something that gives a long-term steady return. Um, and what can you do in between those two things by bringing the parties together, by de-risking it with some financial engineering, but ultimately have to have the ability to start a project. And I, I kind of would agree with what is the path to do that. You want the most proven type technology stuff that's the le least risk that you've done before. That's an important part of the equation to getting at least a single project going. It's the recipe that UAE followed successfully. They said, we want to build something that's been built before. Um, we also want the pipeline of new advanced reactors. We want factories making them, but it's kind of like you can't get to hundreds of these if you can't get to one. So I've been focused on, can we get to one? Great. And I have to say, I was at Dubai at COP28 and from Dubai to New York, what a distance we've traveled. It's really just been absolutely amazing. Um, and from what I can hear, the banking people, they are so definitely interested, especially with this new AI demand that seemed to have pounced out of nowhere uh, and have uh, sh shooken this whole energy landscape by its lapels. Um, but what I hear from the bankers over and over again is allocation of risk, allocation of risk, allocation of risk. How do we spread that risk? And I, I think Charles is the one that's uh, most qualified to offer some ideas. Well, um, 
uh, models using something that is not a traditional model where uh, the traditional thing that has always worked for the risk is the government to take it right so that that is the only that's thing that's what's really happening worked. in ghana that if you look at the expansion of nuclear energy arguably the u.s expansion that was um privately led but by institutions that were so large they effectively work like a government <laughs> they could underwrite right. a large debt and pass those those fees on to customer base and rate base and get their money back but basically every other expansion in the world has been government led but this time in the world as we know the private companies um are driving so much more capital the the net the the market cap of the big four um tech companies is about eight trillion dollars um and the market cap of all the utilities combined is about one trillion and i was at livermore labs last week and the scientists there who are the leading scientists in the u.s were saying we cannot catch up with the tech companies we'll never catch up with them with ai there's so much power in the private sector that you have to figure out a way to incentivize the capitalist urge that's worked for a lot of global expansion to come in and take the risk that a uh, 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 conservative slow moving utility can't take and get some reward for having a large expansion and there's some some idea that that loop of uh, you know risk taking to uh, put into an entity and get the money out is is beneficial so bringing a group together i will say it's so much harder in the developing world so like I, I, I've looked at it in the U.S. You can barely justify it, and I'd love to talk about, um, you know, how can we get that private capital into places where it really needs to be, um, which is even harder. Well, there's certainly a lot of challenges in front of us, but there's also so many good ingredients for success from the technology that we already know well and can last to 100 years today, I found out from a White House official. <laughs> um, we all suspected that. That was the first time I heard it out, spoken out loud um, on stage like that. And to the new technology, and we also have plenty of money and uh, we just have to align um, all the channels so that we can build a bridge from here to our future of abundance. I would really like to thank all of our panelists here um, today for uh, creating such wonderful windows. And also uh, I want to encourage everyone, I've left some uh, few minutes for Q&A. So do we have any questions in the room? We got to start with Nick, come on, <laughs> give the man a microphone. <laughs> Thanks, great panel. Um, I think, yes, this is for Robert, I think. Um, you guys have a pretty unique thing in Ghana, I believe, the a power ship where the ship comes in and sits offshore and uh, produces, has power plant on it. You send fuel to it, it sends electricity back, uh, these like Cara Denise power ship. I, I'm wondering, is that kind of a model, something you would be potentially interested in if like a nuclear plant could be delivered in a, in a similar type of, um, environment on a floating platform, what, you know, while you ramp up regulation and so on, and then that could be like a way to bootstrap the nuclear industry to that kind of a method. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we are also open to that type of technology because um, a similar one has been operating for, I mean, so some years now. Um, the only uh, issue is about the uh, power purchase. If it is financially, I mean, feasible where we have something below 10 cents per kilowatt hour and we can guarantee the, the power purchase agreement, plug and play. All we want to is to have clean energy and make sure we diversify our energy mix. Fantastic. Any more questions? Okay, uh, that gentleman over there. Just wait a minute. We've got we've got one over here from the Zoom community real real quick first. So uh, David from Ghana is asking Robert um, more information about that energy transition. Is Ghana targeting exports to other countries in particular? Have they considered the energy plans of other countries in West Africa going forward and collaborating with other West African countries? together to develop nuclear power to deal with some of these high costs of, of, um, of financing? Yes, um, uh, I was part of the drafting team of the um, Economic Community of uh, West African States um, Energy Policy. 
um, used to have nuclear in, uh, in there in the 1980s. Uh, we reviewed it uh, three years ago. Uh, and they wanted to take nuclear out, so I went on a solo demonstration. So <laughs> it was restored. And um, now I'm ramping up to make sure that there is an um, office set um, at the ECOWAS level uh, so that we can have a regional um, um, office to discuss where we can have a regional plant. Uh, it doesn't matter which country hosts it. If we see the country that has the infrastructure that can host it, it will host it and then, and then uh, transmit the power to every, any country. So that dialogue is going on. But nevertheless, the West African grid is energy hungry and we know the, the threshold to, uh, to make profitable I mean, power transmission. So once you have the power and you are within that energy threshold, the West African power um, group will, will take the power and distribute. So I don't think there's an issue with that. Sky's the limit. And next one. Yes, I had Charles Orkbun here. I think this question is for Char other Charles. Um, I am curious. Um, I am originally from Georgia, where there's Plant Vogel, and which took much longer to build, was much more expensive. And the controversy is that there are rate hikes on electricity in the state of Georgia, affecting mostly black and brown communities disproportionately. So when we think about the cost of nuclear, how do we protect black and brown communities from expensive energy? Um, what one thing um, I've heard about Vogel is that if you look at the rates at Georgia after the, the finished plant, they're still below national average, which sounds good. It probably is true at scale. In California, we pay much more than Georgia with all the renewables. So that's that's one lens. That's not as comforting when your bill just went up. Like nobody likes that, right? And I think that's the future that we're looking at with energy is that everybody needs more of it and the prices are going up. Um, the, the industries, um, the utilities, there's, there's no sign of stopping energy demand and ultimately the prices are gonna follow. Um, what I would hope is that at a at system level, we know that nuclear is the most efficient. And if we did it, if we did 10, 100 Vogels, that is actually our best chance of getting it down. But um, could we have, um, you know, the right thing to do is have the government do it. The U.S. government get in, backstop it as much, and then have capitalists come in and backstop it and eventually get that to the lowest price. But I think we as the world and part of the country is kind of are headed to some pain one way or the other with or without nuclear that's that's um the path but i think we should look at vogel as a success it wasn't i know it ha i'd love to hear more about the impression from within georgia everybody in the utility industry decided that's the reason we will never do another nuclear plant and it wasn't one month or three weeks after it finished where the secretaries were running down there and saying, look, we did it. So I, I think we really do need to look at it as a first of a kind. Lots of mistakes are made to capitalize on doing it again and again um, as one of the parts of the strategy. I just like to add a little bit to that because I know the ratepayers of Georgia bore the tip of the spear on Vogel. And that was wrong, not because Vogel wasn't worth building, but we know that by building the first nuclear power plant after decades of inaction, maybe we didn't anticipate, we should have anticipated that that was gonna cost more. And the benefit of it is felt not just all throughout the US nuclear industry, but throughout the world. And it was wrong for the uh, ratepayers of Georgia because of the way the system is designed to have borne that cost that should have been spread. But guess what? Now that Vogel, unlike, say, Summer, which never completed, Vogel's up and running, it'll be creating clean electricity, at least for the next 80 years, maybe 100 years. And that's doing a whole lot of good for the people of Georgia because it's bringing industry. They need the juice so badly over there for the EVs, for the different kind of manufacturing. And um, the people of Georgia in aggregate, I can say, despite the higher cost of the plant, are very glad they have it now. First two react. First two, first two, good point. That lady in the back. Somebody give her a microphone, please. Uh, Susan. 
I think this will have to be the last question. Hi, um, I want to ask this of Robert and Charlene. Can you speak? We've been talking about the macro. Let's talk about the micro. How will better energy, more energy impact the women and the girls in countries in the global south, your countries? Yeah. Okay. One thing which our energy transition, I mean, um, looked at was um, clean cooking. In Ghana, most uh, women and children um, use uh, firewood um, and go and cut firewood for cooking. Now we are looking at clean cooking. If we make electricity cheap, then they don't need to go and cut the trees, but then they will use electricity for cooking. And they will stop inhaling uh, suits into their lungs and having lungs infections. And also they will have enough time to, I mean, use that time going to look for firewood to study and then become, I mean, use that uh, period economically to advance in, uh, in their lifetime. So that is one single thing which I think accounts for the women and children. Thank you. Uh, for, my own, so on. Um, for Jamaica, I think um, it's, it, it'll be more tied, um, at least to me, with education. Um, so I'm also the I'm the co-founder of Empowering Garrison Girls, which is a Jamaica nonprofit that provides um, financial assistance and mentorship to um, young girls in Jamaica living in um, high crime at risk areas. Um, currently, Jamaica uh, is struggling with um, um, education access, primarily because you know you 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 have to pay for it right at all levels and so if you cannot afford that education education you just don't get educated um and so i think with um nuclear energy stepping um into the space in in jamaica that's creating that would create opportunities for um uh, increased careers more more exposure more access um to 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 not only um, you know um, girls and women, but, but but of course also men. But it it opens up the room for um, entry for for these young girls and women to to look at new fields um, in the same way I did, and accidentally became the first um, black female to graduate with a PhD in, in nuclear engineering from the University of Florida. And so things like that from the education standpoint. Thank you. Go Gators. From an education standpoint, I think that's where nuclear energy can play a, a big role. I want to thank all our wonderful panelists today and to all of you. And this concludes our uh, panel on energy abundance. Let's go after it. Yeah. yeah. Woo. And uh, it's time for lunch, everybody. It's uh, uh, around one now. Come back here, 145 sharp for our next programming.